Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in our series, COVID-19 in Context, News Coverage and News Literacy in Uncertain Times. I'm Sunshine Menezes. I'm the Executive Director of the University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute, and I'm very glad that you've chosen to join us today. We're bringing you these webinars in partnership with the News Literacy Project, a nonpartisan national education nonprofit that provides educators with tools and resources to teach their students how to navigate today's complex information landscape. Also, they um, focus on helping people learn to judge the credibility of information for themselves and become engaged and informed participants in our democracy. And we're glad for their partnership. Metcalf Institute's mission is to engage diverse audiences in conversations about science and especially the environment through webinars like this and by providing education, training, and resources for professional journalists, researchers, and other science communicators. On behalf of Metcalf Institute, I'd like to thank the Ruth and Hal Launders Charitable Trust for supporting this series. The COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented challenge in many respects, as we all know. In addition to the havoc and trauma it has caused in our personal lives, it has challenged our governance, public health, and economic systems from local to global scales. The daunting scientific uncertainties about the virus and the ways we've been inundated with information, some good, some bad, some who knows, have fueled one of the most urgent science communication challenges of our time. This four-part webinar series will bring together journalists, news literacy, education experts, and scientists to explore these issues. We're kicking off the series today with a panel discussion about news coverage in the pandemic. But we hope you'll also join us for our upcoming webinars focusing on news literacy skills, how to fact check like a pro, and how to make sense of scientific uncertainty. We'll put a link in the chat in just a moment to register for the rest of the series. So now I'm pleased to introduce today's panelists. Uh, we will begin by hearing from Amy Mitchell. Amy is the Director of Journalism Research at the Pew Research Center. She's responsible for the center's research related to news and information, including how the public accesses, engages with, and creates news, what news organizations are, what news organizations are providing, and how technology is changing all of these elements. She's an expert in research design, methods evaluation, analysis, and writing. She specializes in how technology is changing the flow of news information today and the influence of political identity on news choices. Prior to joining the Pew Research Center, she was a Congressional Research Associate at the American Enterprise Institute, where she researched public policy and the relationship of the press, the public, and government. Following uh, Ms. Mitchell, we'll hear from Apoorva Mandavili. She's an award-winning science journalist and a frequent contributor to the New York Times, where she writes mostly about infectious disease. She's also written for The Atlantic, The New Yorker, Slate, Nature, Scientific American, and others. She received the 2019 Victor Cohn Prize for Excellence in Medical Reporting from the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing, in addition to many other journalism awards. She also founded and serves as Editor-in-Chief of Spectrum, an autism news website, and with her colleague Nita Subaraman, she launched Culture Dish, a nonprofit dedicated to enhancing diversity in science journalism. We'll then hear from Erica Hensley, who is an investigative reporter for Mississippi Today, a nonprofit news outlet serving the state of Mississippi with a forward facing mission of civic engagement and public dialogue through service journalism, live events, and digital outreach. She's a Knight Foundation Fellow and the recipient of the Doris O'Donnell Innovations in Investigative Journalism Fellowship. She received a bachelor's in print journalism and political science from the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, as well as a master's in health and medical journalism from the University of Georgia. And then finally, we will hear from Jill Jackson, who is the news director for KUOW, the NPR affiliate in Seattle, um, where she is responsible for managing KUOW's news coverage. An Emmy award-winning journalist, Ms. Jackson has had an extensive career in journalism. She was a producer for NPR's All Things Considered, a congressional producer for CBS News for a decade, and later led CBS This Morning's Washington Newsroom. 
She was also a senior producer for Face the Nation. So with that, I'm very pleased to turn this over to our first speaker, Amy Mitchell. I will stop screen sharing so Amy can take it over. Oh, one more point that I wanted to make, which is that um, if you would like to share any questions, please use the, use the Q and A um, function and we'll respond to them. Thanks. Hi everybody, it's terrific to be able to join this way. Um, and I look forward to a conversation um, for the next hour. I'm gonna start things off by talking a little bit about sort of Americans' attention to um, COVID-19 news, their perceptions about what's happening, their views um, to a certain extent about, about the news media and the news media coverage. Um, to start, um, make sure I can do my slide here. Um, there we go. Um, you know, to start, there are two different periods where we've been in the field asking specifically about people's attention to news. And it is important as this is such a fast evolving story and the news cycle is just changing so rapidly to think about the points in time of when these surveys were conducted. And so you can see here, the first time period was between March 10 and 16. Um, and that is when um, the World Health Organization announced um, this as a pandemic. It is when President Trump issued a travel ban from the US to European countries um, and several universities began to announce closure. So that's sort of the, early, the first time period and the cases reported in the US were beginning to really climb. Then the second time period, just, just a couple of weeks later, we were at the point where um, you know, the governors, many governors had announced stay at home restrictions. New York became the ep epic center um, of the virus itself. And um, the reported deaths and cases in the US about tripled. So just to sort of give you a sense of time, we are actually in the field again now as we speak. Um, so I look forward to being able to continue to share data and findings with folks. You can see here that this is a news story that Americans are following quite closely. We have more than half at this point that say they're following it very closely, and the vast, vast majority that say they're following it at least fairly closely. There are some interesting differences if you look by age. Um, the older generations, the 65 plusers there, had, uh, you know, from the start been the group to be following this most closely, the news about this most closely, um, with your 18 to 29 year olds at the bottom. And over this time period, we saw increases in the portion of people who say they're following it very closely, largely in that middle section, the 50 to 64 year olds, the 30 to 49 year olds. The 18 to 29 year olds really didn't budge in terms of you know, the percentage saying they're paying very close attention to this. So it's going to be interesting to continue to watch and see if that is an area where there gets to be sort of a, a more close following among those younger uh, adults in the US. We also ask about sort of how well the news media are covering this. This is something we ask, you know, a number of times about different types of events and topics. And you can see overall in that first bar chart that 70% um, of US adults say that the news media are, follow, are, are covering this pretty well. So, you know, it's a pretty positive response from um, the US population overall. We do see differences here um, by party, by political party, um, which represent to some extent sort of what we say, what we see traditionally when we ask about news media more broadly um, with Republicans being, and those who lean Republicans being less positive about the role the news media played and Democrats being more positive. But one of the things that we were interested in trying to see is the extent to which this is a, a time where we have perhaps the, you know, for the first time, a real health crisis that turns political in many ways. And so we certainly see here in these numbers that just the evaluations of the news media do tend to be um, dif differ by party, although Republicans do tend to rate their own news media um, more highly. We ask about exaggerated, exaggerating the risks. And again, if you, this is during that first survey, so that earlier March, mid-March time period, and we see that the public overall um, does think that the, the risks were exaggerated, at least to a certain extent. Um, and 
if you look at, you know, it's 30% that say the media got the risks about right. And this is just as things were starting to evolve. So this is, again, something that we're going to be interested in continuing to watch. But you do already see here, again, quite a difference when you look by political party with Republicans and those who lean Republicans much more likely to be expressing um, a sense of exaggerated risks from the news media than those who are Democrat or lean Democratic. One of the other things that we've done, this is actually a part of a year long effort and we're um, going back in the field surveying a very large, we're at 10,000 plus in these surveys for most. So it's a very large segment um, of, you know, representative segment of the population. And um, one of the other things we did was we asked people about where they get their news. And so we wanted to look at differences based on media diet um, in what started to be sort of an election news project and has turned more into a COVID news project. Um, and so we have people um, organized within party according to the types to what their media diet is. And bear with me, I know this is a little bit complicated, but I think it'll make sense in a second. If you look at the Republicans, and those who lean Republicans. We asked people if they got news in the past week from 30 different sources, specific sources. And then we, according to people's responses, we organize those sources based on their audience composition. So whether their audience leans right politically, leans left politically, or is more mixed. And so if you look at the portion, that top portion under the Republicans, 63% of Republicans who said they only got news from outlets whose audiences lean right politically said that the news media had greatly exaggerated the risks of the virus. It drops within, the Repu within Republicans, it drops to 42% among those who didn't get any of the, who got news only from outlets whose audiences don't lean right politically. And we, so we see a, quite a difference in people's assessment of the news media as one example based on their media diet. And we also ask about sort of certain knowledge or perceptions people have about <clears throat> the coronavirus and other events surrounding it. And one of the questions we asked was about how it originated. So the actual creation, the origination of the virus itself of COVID-19. And if you recall at the time, there was a lot of conversation about the creation of it with the public health experts stating again and again that it came about naturally. 43% um, of the public um, answered in a way that was in line with what the public health experts are saying. 23%, though, about a quarter, say that they felt it was developed intentionally in a lab. 6% um, accidentally in a lab, and about a quarter that say they're not sure. So if we look at this, these answers, again, by that, whole, by that media diet, um, or which I'll get to in a minute. So there's another question here about the availability of a vaccine, which was another large part of the media narrative in the conversation during the time of this survey. And here you have about half, 49%, that again, we're in line with what public health groups have said, that the av availability will take a year or more for a vaccine to be administered to the public. And just under a quarter that think it'll be in the next few months. So if we look at these, these, this question, particularly the developed the origination question by media diet, we again see quite a difference based on where people are turning for their news. And so you see here 40% of Republicans who say they got news in the past week only from outlets with right-leaning audiences said that the um, COVID-19 was developed intentionally in a lab. 25, and that drops quite a bit when you get to other Republicans, right? Republicans who are not in that mix. So even within party, there's quite a difference. And then if you look within the Democrats, you have 61%. So you have over half of the groups that are getting um, news only from outlets with left-leaning audiences who say it came about naturally. 55% um, who it comes from a mix of outlets. And the group that doesn't go to any outlets that have left-leaning audiences actually had um, quite a different um, set of answers with a large portion saying they aren't sure. Uh, and so we also, one last, thing, one last area of sort of media diet that I'll share is in addition to sort of that grouping, we do also ask people of their main source for news. And if you look at just within the sort of the cable um, channels here, you can see again, quite a difference based on people who said MSNBC, was their main source for political news, um, those who said CNN and those who said Fox. And you can see in the first set on the left-hand side here, I think it's your left, 
is um, when a vaccine will be available. And you see 78% of those who name as MSNBC as their main source for news say it will take a year or more. That drops quite a bit to a little over half of CNN and about half who said that um, their main source of news was Fox News. You have the highest portion um, who say it will be in the next few months are those who name their main source as Fox News. And again, if, and we see something similar if we ask a question, if we look at the question about the creation um, and the origin of COVID-19 with even greater difference between the MSNBC and the Fox News folks and CNN, um, uh, those who use CNN as their main source falling more in the middle. So I'm just gonna close quickly with just another element of this, right, of, is just sort of that the idea of made up news and misinformation and what falls into that bucket. And so we ask people about um, whether they've come across news and information about the COVID-19 outbreak that seems completely made up. So that's a pretty direct right statement, not something confusing, but actually completely made up. And you have the majority of the public that say they've come across at least some um, news, 12% a lot, 35% some, another third that say some, but not much. If you look at the mix of people's responses, and I'm not going to go into detail on this, but we have sort of more detail we could talk about in the in the Q and A, is it? It's a whole range of things, and it really speaks to the degree to which Americans, how they think about what is made up, um, what is not made up, what is made up, and some and certain confusion around some of the basic facts. So the largest area of um, responses. So then we followed with an open end, let's say name a statement or claim um, that stood out to you. F about four in 10 of them um, mentioned something that had to do with the magnitude of risk, that people said the risk was too high and that was made up. People said the risk was low and that was made up. Um, details about the virus, which is ranges from sort of where it created, country involvement, et cetera, um, surrounding events. And then a number, 10%, that also stated things such that were statements made by politicians that they claimed were made up or things said about politicians that they said were made up. Um, so a very wide range of what certain parts of the population, what Americans categorize as made up news. And I will stop there. Thank you, Amy. Um, there's one quick question that came in that you can address, which was, um, it, it, someone said, it doesn't the term developed intentionally, quote unquote, um, provide maybe too much of a lead? They say, is this a misleading way to word the question? We want to know if it was leaked intentionally by accident or occurred naturally. Um, you know, that's a great question. We, we spent a lot of time on the wording of these questions and tested a number and um, that had been ways that it was being referred to specifically. And so we are following what some certain lines in, in public spaces um, were during that time. So um, we are trying to capture a reality of what certain parts of the conversation are um, in these public spaces. So I do think, um, and you see the large portion that went there as opposed to the accidental creation of the lab. So we, we also wanted to be sure to offer both of those. And I didn't know how those, you know, answers would fall out, of course. Um, uh, so that if people thought there was some lab involvement, but weren't sure, you could have answered either way. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. And another person asked if this is report, if the report is available on the Pew site, and I am sure it is. So we can share that link in the chat. Yes, it is. And there's a whole, I've just mentioned there's an entire data tool. So one of the things in this project is we're making all the data publicly immediately as we release our first report, even with a lot of data we haven't been able to write to yet. So um, I certainly invite you to dig into that. It's pretty user friendly. We're happy to help anybody if they have questions. Great. Thank you very much. So we'll take more questions at the end of um, the presentations, everyone. For now, we'll move on to Apurva Mandavili and um, she can take it from here. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, as Sunshine mentioned, I've been writing mostly for uh, the New York Times. And in fact, actually, um, I'm joining the staff of the Times um, as of May 18th. So most of my experience reporting on the coronavirus has been with that paper. 
Um, I'm a biologist uh, by background originally many, many years ago. And so I've really been coming to the science journalism that I've been doing, um, you know, looking at the biology of the virus um, and uh, tackling things that um, maybe not every other journalist would be able to do because I think, um, you know, so little about this virus that the, that background has helped me sort of see some stories that um, I think are very interesting. So um, or very early on, the first week of February, I, was, um, I wrote about how the, um, the illness does not seem to be very severe in kids. Um, and that was partly based on my experience reporting on SARS um, and MERS because um, those also didn't really affect kids. Um, and actually no kids died from either of those. I know there have been a few with, um, with COVID, but um, in general, it's much milder in kids. Um, and I've also been writing about the risks to pregnant women and fetuses, because that's something that people in general, doctors uh, in general worry about with any respiratory infection, they're um, usually more vulnerable. Um, so I've been looking at that. Um, one of the most interesting stories that I think I've uh, uh, reported is on um, a little known phenomenon called cytokine storm. Not so little known anymore because it's turning out to be quite important in COVID. Um, it's basically a situation in which, you know, normally when you're exposed to a virus, your body kicks up an immune response, but in some subset of cases, maybe one in five people or so, the immune system kind of goes haywire and doesn't know how to turn itself off. Um, and so in those people, it, it, the response keeps raging on long after the infection is not a threat. Um, and actually that, that immune system itself becomes what's harmful and might even, um, you know, kill people. So uh, that was a super interesting story. Um, and I loved digging into the, the science there. Um, and I probably have gotten more emails in response to that story than almost anything else I've written so far. Um, and this pandemic. Um, and then lately I've been um, doing a lot of stories on the antibody beat. So you've all heard, I'm sure, a lot about how the diagnostic tests have had a lot of problems. Um, and But now we're in the phase where we're also talking about antibody tests. Um, and these are tests that basically look to see if somebody has been exposed to the virus at any point in the past and has antibodies. And so maybe he's immune. And, and so these tests have become really important in the conversation about when do we reopen the economy? When do we reintegrate society? Who gets to go back to work? Will there be immunity certificates to say who's immune? And I've seen my role as a science journalist in really digging into the science there about how good are these tests really? What can they tell us? What do we know about immunity to the coronavirus? Turns out not a lot. We don't know really um, whether people who make antibodies are really immune, how long that immunity lasts, um, whether people can be reinfected. We think probably not, scientists mostly think probably not, but there are a lot of unanswered questions. And so I've seen my role as reporting, not just on the sudden availability of these tests and their promise, but really can they deliver? Um, so I've written a bunch of stories along those lines. Um, and one of those uh, was on the front page of the Times on Monday. And I think that story in particular illustrates the power of a big newspaper like the New York Times. Um, I worked on that story with a couple of colleagues from the investigative desk, um, and it was edited by uh, an editor on the investigative desk, um, Rebecca Corbett, who's amazing and has uh, won a Pulitzer, and she directed the coverage, for example, on um, the Harvey Weinstein um, articles. And so um, the investigative reporters on that story brought their investigative skills, I brought the science, we all investigated um, the availability of these tests together. The three of us together interviewed dozens of patients, doctors, scientists, uh, regulators, you know, federal health officials, uh, companies, you know, both companies making tests, companies buying tests, um, you name it. So we interviewed a ton of people. Um, but the power of the times is also that, you know, we had questions about what Italy was doing, what Germany was doing, what Spain was doing, because we'd heard that some of these countries had bought tests that were turning out not to be very good and we wanted details. Um, and that's the kind of thing where we could ask the foreign desk for information and the reporters in those places could send us back information that we could then incorporate into the story. We had questions about, you know, I had heard that China was cracking down on exporting some tests. So we asked the China desk for details on that and got some really good information about that. Um, we had questions about which tech companies are buying these tests, are Amazon and Google and companies like that buying tests. Um, and you know, the tech desk had some great contacts that helped us get that information. 
you know, we had, um, we were wondering whether sports teams are looking into these tests and um, the sports desk had done a story about Major League Baseball um, participating in a big study. So that's the kind of thing where, you know, we had three bylines on the story, but then there were, you know, uh, 15 or something like that contributors to the story overall. And um, we pulled that all together in one week. Um, so that's, I think the, um, you know, both on a macro level for a story like that, but also on a micro level with a story that, you know, I did an explainer on antibody tests as soon as Dr. Fauci talked about how those tests are going to be very important. So, you know, in both those ways, very quick and also sort of diving deep, we can really cover this pandemic from a variety of angles. So I'll leave it there and take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Porva. There's, um, I think, a very interesting question that came in. Um, someone said, as a biologist by background, how much of the reporting in your stories is you interpreting data on your own versus interviewing other experts? Um, well, I'm not interpreting data on my own, but I am asking questions um, and asking probably more probing questions than I would know to ask if I didn't have that background. So I am constantly pushing, you know, if a researcher says um, this test has X percent specificity, I can push more and say, but, but what about this table? Why, you know, what about this number that you have here? How does that square with what you're saying? So I'm not so much interpreting it myself, but I know enough to not take what they say at face value and then to go to other experts and say, what do you think of what the scientist said? Um, so I, I would say it's more along those lines. Great. Um, okay, there's another question here that I was going to ask. Um, there are a bunch of very specific kind of science focused questions that are coming in and because the the aim of our conversation today is really more about the journalism. I'm going to move past those for now. Um, because I'm sure we could spend a ton of time on them. Um, but we'll come back and have more time for more questions with Aporva in a little bit. Let's move on now. Thank you so much, Aporva. And as one person said, and I agree, congratulations on um, the job at New York Times. That's wonderful news. So let's move on to Erica Hensley now, and um, we look forward to hearing her thoughts. Hey everyone, my name is Erica Hensley. I'm an investigative reporter with Mississippi Today in Jackson, Mississippi. I do have a background in public health though, um, so it's come into kind of unprecedented focus of over the past month, of course, in the newsroom. So I've kind of pivoted that um, investigation focus to be a little bit more just public health focused, but I think it's actually been a good thing because I'm, you know, putting both an investigative lens and a health lens onto just, you know, what has really become daily COVID coverage for us. Um, as a nonprofit um, newsroom, we tend to be a little bit more focused on deep dives and long term investigations rather than just daily beat coverage but I have seen that um, shift kind of in another unprecedented way over the past six weeks. Um, I'm basically spending all morning looking at the numbers and trends, just kind of picking up on what the health department has published that day, uh, analyzing the data in you know, the spreadsheets I've been tracking over time, and then also kind of getting that information out to the rest of the reporters to help guide their COVID coverage. You know, we have a criminal justice beat, we have a politics beat, we have a poverty beat and an education beat, um, like a lot of other newsrooms. So I'm basically trying to interpret the data in a way that I can just get them what they need to know so they don't have to spend all day in the spreadsheets like I often do. Um, so that role, you know, with that public health lens, I'm basically trying to help guide our newsroom's coverage. What stories can we tell? Um, we all wear many hats all of the time as a local newsroom, uh, but specifically when we're dealing with this kind of unprecedented pandemic um, and all of our focus being shifted towards that. So I'm just trying to kind of take some of the stress of the unknown science details, the unknown medical details, the unknown health details, take that stress off of the other reporters and help just get them the information they need to continue their beat coverage now with this uh, COVID focus. A lot of that in Mississippi uh, recently, since we started releasing the data, which I guess was um, about 10 days ago now, has been the gendered and racial aspect of the COVID impact here. 
Um, we're starting to see that nationally as the CDC has come out with data. We were actually one of the first states um, to start releasing race data. And I think that's a lot because local journalists know that a lot of our um, health outcomes tend to disproportionately affect African Americans here. And we have the um, most African Americans in any state in the nation. So we're sort of primed to understand those disproportionate effects here. So we pushed really hard on the health department to get that uh, data before most states were releasing it. And I'm proud to say that, that they did. And we've been analyzing that. But currently we're at 53% of our cases are among African Americans, 63% of our deaths, and 59% of our cases are among women. Um, a lot of that, of course, as you'll hear from other panelists, is just kind of exposure points. Who is out in the community that's more likely to get it? It's certainly not that these groups are more susceptible than others, um, which is a misconception we've you know, had to be clear about here. Um, but yeah, just looking at the nature of the workforce and, and who is out in the community and thus far has, has been uh, more at risk for um, showing a COVID case. Uh, as far as how I've been approaching this just as a reporter, I think at the beginning I had to focus more on big picture preparedness, like where is Mississippi uh, as far as our hospitals and our public health entities being prepared to handle that. Um, now I've kind of shifted that there's more data. I'm using more of that data to help contextualize political decision making. I've never been a political reporter and I don't really have <laughs> any desire uh, to be a political reporter, but you know, the data I'm interpreting puts me in a unique position to help shed some light on hopefully the data that the officials are using as well and how they're looking at those trends to make the decisions uh, this week as well as other southern states were getting pretty vocal about considering lifting some of the shelter in place restrictions. Um, and of course, there's a lot of controversy that comes with that. So I'm trying to just back out, again, look at the data, talk to people on the ground and see what that tells me about uh, Mississippi's sort of unique position in this. The thread I've tried to keep all along has been providing context to the social determinants of health here asking what about Mississippi makes our response and needs different from the national picture and even neighboring uh, regional states. And that has come with a lot of challenges, of course. I think everyone that's watching this knows that information is constant. It can be really hard to keep up. Um, personally, as a reporter, I always try and answer as many questions from readers as possible, especially as a local, we are statewide, but we have a local focus. Um, you know, it's important for readers to trust me and sources to trust me. You know, I'm going to see these people out in the grocery store once we're <laughs> going back to the grocery store more frequently. But Mississippi is a really tight knit community. Um, so it's important to me to keep that interface with readers um, live, you know, and, and contextualized. Of course, as reporters, we always have to sort of manage our inbox in that way. Like we can't respond to everything. And I'm not going to respond to someone that's just you know, telling me and I'm, I'm an awful person, certainly, because they didn't like a story. But if someone has a real question, it's my job to answer that. Um, so I've, I've made that, you know, very forefront in my focus as far as getting those answers to people. And that, that's been a challenge. Um, but I also think our newsroom has, has met this challenge and risen up to it. I'm always really proud of our work. Um, we definitely filled a void as far as statewide investigations when we came online four years ago. Um, we have 12 reporters all across the state, so we're small, but that's also pretty big for a Mississippi newsroom. Um, like I said, we tend to do more deep dives, but I think a lot of this has forced us to kind of fall back on our training. Most of us are trained in print journalism, and that's just like the daily grind, the daily beat, working your sources, boots on the ground. That's the stuff we're trained in. So I've been really pleasantly surprised to see how much we've kind of just like fallen back to that. Um, not making assumptions certainly about why certain decisions are made, in, uh, why certain decisions were made, but actually getting on the ground, looking at the context, figuring out why, and getting that daily turn story to readers has, has really been our focus. And um, it's, it's, been, it's, it's made me really proud to work here. Um, as far as how I think our coverage has compared to national and other local coverage, I think, as always, uh, approaches to information needs should be statewide, or, or vary by state, and also have a statewide approach. 
um, information needs are very different uh, from city to city, from town to town. Mississippi Delta's needs are very different from uh, Jackson's needs. But I think looking at those, not in a vacuum, but just like knowing the audience. That's our job as reporters always. But I think it's just come into sharp, sort of acute focus right now. Um, luckily, we do have reporters across the state, so we can sort of tailor different stories to, to different audiences. And then just, of course, uh, listening. That's, that's always our job. And I, as a reporter, have just really tried to make sure that's my priority right now. Because, you know, it's, it's literally life or death as far as getting people information they need to stay safe. So that's been my approach. I'm happy to answer um, any questions and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Erica. There's one question that just came in that um, I would love to hear your thoughts about. Um, so someone asked, do you find that after people learn about the, the local aspects of, of the, the crisis in terms of um, people looking at local and state politicians to solve those problems versus national government. Um, and I guess that's the question. Do you find that after people learn about the local aspects, aspects that they are looking to local and state politicians versus the national government to solve their problems? Um, and then they go on to say, do you think that's an important transition for your readers to make a focus on local or state uh, governments that can make immediate change? Yeah, that's interesting. Um... Mississippi is just very individualistic in nature. So we do sort of have more of a focus on local and state government here than watching the federal picture. Um, that's both, I think, purposeful from certain citizens and also just by nature, like I said, of being a tight knit community where we're all, um, I think, much more involved in each other's decision makings. And I, I think that's been a good thing as far as how it's scaled up um, to our state government's response. Um, you know, we have daily press conferences with the governor, which has been also another level of unprecedented uh, transparency here. I've been super pleased to see that. So we're actually like having daily conversations with the governor and uh, the state, the um, state health officer, head of the public health department, asking how they're making their decisions. And they are kind of echoing what I'm hearing from, from the readers, that it's really like on the ground response here not really looking so much at the national picture. I think that's always kind of a Mississippi approach, but I've, I've definitely seen that um, be applied more so than, than usual. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're now going to move on to final remarks from Jill Jackson, and then we'll um, go back to, there are a ton of really great convers uh, questions being asked that we can come back to a little bit. So Jill. Hi. Um, Thank you for, for putting this all together. It's been really interesting so far. Um, for us here in Washington, it's been almost two months um, since we learned of the first community transmission of the coronavirus and the first deaths. Um, it has been 49 days since our news station at KOW went almost entirely remote. And it's been six weeks since Seattle closed its schools. Um, so we've been at this a very long time and or at least it feels sometimes like forever um and sometimes i feel a little bit like the ghost of covid future um so um uh and yet things here have been improving with the stay-at-home orders and all of that um but there's still so much we don't know um i would just want to walk you all through kind of the phases we've gone through in our own coverage I mean, news of the, the first, the news broke um, and it was just the fire hose immediately went off and we were in constant breaking news mode, both on our website. I mean, we're really not just a radio station. We are also a digital organization. So um, we immediately started a live updated blog on our, on our website with just constant updates. It was all hands on deck. Goodbye to the beats that we had in our traditional, traditionally sort of organized newsroom. Um, and then immediately adjusting to remote work plans and, and, go, and troubleshooting the technological hurdles that come from reporting and broadcasting from home, which is particularly challenging uh, in radio. Um, at the same time as managing our own emotions, exhaustion, and um, as we all are, we're all living the news that we're covering. Um, we, 
I would say these phases all kind of build on each other. So it's not like you completely move on when you move into the next, but I would say the next phase we went into is a complete uh, overnight reorganization of our newsroom. So identifying the main areas of coverage we wanted and organizing it. So we have, I, when I think about it, I think about it as three teams, basically. We have our public health and science team, which is focused on testing, hospital capacity, PPE, um, health workers, modeling, uh, long-term care facilities, what's going on with our homeless population, and of course, the race for a vaccine. Then there's the um, how we live and work uh, team, which is basically business and economy. And that in Seattle means the big businesses like Boeing, Amazon, Microsoft, um, but then also all the small businesses that are in, in huge trouble. Um, we've covered essential workers, gig workers, artists, um, schools, kids, parents trying to deal with all with schooling and kids, um, restaurant workers and owners. And of course, we've been looking also for the innovators and helpers. And then the third team is kind of a government response and accountability team. So those are our folks who are organized, who are following what the governor is doing, local public health, um, any plans to reopen and, and hurdles or obstacles to doing so. Um, the status, uh, checking on the status of what they are doing to make sure we have adequate PPE, which we still don't, or adequate testing supplies, which we still don't. Um, and then, of course, doing some of the accountability part of what mistakes were made, what did we miss that allowed this to happen and get so bad, especially in the beginning when we were the epicenter for a, for a brief moment, um, especially at the long-term care facility in a Seattle suburb here, um, and what lessons are we learning in real time? So immediately overhauling people onto these new beats, and they, I am so proud of the news team for just going, they have been all in on it. Then I think about uh, a couple weeks ago, we were like, you know what? Okay, things, we're flattening the curve here. The breaking news isn't stopping, but it feels a little slower. I think we're now at the time where we can take on some special projects. So we started Voices of the Pandemic, which is first person stories of what they're going through um, from health workers, uh, essential workers. Um, we had a, a woman on this morning who's both deaf and blind and who relies on someone to be right there for touch so that she can communicate even if, with a doctor if she needed to. Um, we're looking at um, one block in Seattle and showing the impact of unemployment just on that block. And that's one we're gonna be doing both um, as a digital piece and, um, and broadcast. And then of course, obituaries. Um, and then the phase that we're in really right now is um, where we are covering plans and pressure to reopen. This is kind of, I'm calling it lives versus livelihood, where that's that delicate balance of wanting people to be able to get back to work, wanting people to be able to support their families or just even get by um, without taking such drastic steps that we lose too many lives. Um, we're also at a point now where we're just we're, there are so many models and and it's difficult to know which ones to trust i think we just use them as a guide but i mean even our our lawmakers are struggling with the same thing um we are like erica mentioned also covering and looking for the inequities um of of the healthcare that of the healthcare system and who's being most impacted um and we're um we're just really kind of still in covering the breaking news too. I wanted to share just a few of the, what I would say were our biggest challenges. Um, one was just figuring out how to cover the news safely. So we um, purchased six foot boom poles so that we can put our microphone on the end of it and go out into the field and interview people with from a safe distance. Um, we've come up with ways that people can do record phone interviews from home, um, that they can, everyone, all of our reporters have built these kind of like pillow forts or towel forts where they can go in and track their, um, their scripts so that, uh, and then they file it to the news. We've had to, um, we have most of our broadcast hosts working from home. We only have one who's still in the building because her internet connection has not been strong enough to, to support the broadcasting from home. Um, but we're working on that. Um, but some of the things I would say I'm most proud of um, would be just our output in general. Our output has gone up 40% last month. It went up 40% last month compared to January. Um, our web numbers in, in a, a normal uh, 1 million 
page views would be a good month for us at KOW on KOW.org. And we had one week before last, we hit one and a half million just in that week. Um, we launched a podcast on the day, it was the day after the, the first, we learned of the first deaths, um, or we thought they were the first deaths in the country at the time. Um, of, uh, and then the following Monday, so two days later, um, we launched a daily news podcast that has been, that was meant to be, we were planning to do that anyway, um, but kind of our local version of the daily, um, but it has basically become our COVID podcast. I think we've done every episode on COVID except for um, one on the day that we actually had a, a primary, our primary election. Um, so that's been pretty, I've been incredibly proud of just see, seeing the, the sheer magnitude of the work, but also the quality um, and just very proud of that. Um, where we are now, and then I'll wrap things up, are just some questions that I have um, where uh, I, you know, we're at this point where all of our coverage has been COVID. And I'm curious if people, like when are people get, you know, there, there's clearly still high interest in this, but when are people gonna just be over it? When are they gonna wanna just tune, tune out? When are they gonna wanna break from it all? Um, so kind of trying to look for some signs of that. Um, and then I also think, I'm thinking a lot about some opportunities that may have been missed in a, in a, a city like Seattle, where we have a really great, strong local newspaper. You have us, we have another public radio station, KNKX in Seattle. Um, I'm kind of wondering, like, did we all need to do our own how to make a mask piece? Did we all need to do our own how to um, make hand sanitizer piece? Uh, were there, are there opportunities for collaboration that we have missed and that maybe when we can reset, we can look for maybe those opportunities next time? Um, I think given the fact that a lot of our audiences overlap, that there might be there there might be something we can do going forward. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, there's one quick question I'll address specifically to you, and then we'll open this up more broadly. Um, because Washington State was one of the first places to have experience both treating and covering the virus, did you or other Washington Washington State news outlets get any inquiries from other news organizations in other parts of the country looking to you for how to how to do this, how to cover it? Uh, yes, actually. So I ended up writing a piece for Current, which is a public radio um, publication um, or public media publication on a newsroom's guide for covering the coronavirus. And that was everything from I covered everything from the technological hurdles to um, to also just trying to take care of your people and the like acknowledging that this is a mental health challenge for your reporters um, to um, sort of, to also just some of the coverage ideas and some of those, those kind of new beats that uh, we created on the fly. Um, and I did a webinar for some public radio stations. Um, and then just, you know, mostly though it's um, I, like one of the great things about being in public media is that we are we are all um, committed to being a resource for each other in the system. So that has been really wonderful because I've also been able to benefit from what other stations have been doing, um, including WNYC. I was on calls with WNYC um, because we were literally for a moment there, it was like when we were talking, Seattle was about three days ahead in their coverage based on where the news story was. And then like the next week it flipped and New York was three days ahead in terms of what was happening with Washington State or we were just going, starting to go in different directions. Um, then uh, also just, it's been wonderful to have the resource of NPR itself um, because they have their science desk. And if we have questions, I can go to them and ask, um, ask them for advice, ask them for what, what are the safety protocols they're, they're um, advising their reporters to take and then I can pass those on to my people. Um, so I feel very lucky to be in that system where we're all learning from each other. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so again, there are so many great questions here. We're not, there's no way we can get to all of them, but a couple of them that I would love to hear from any or all of you on relate to um, what a great job you're, uh, you're all doing in a way. So someone asked, do you think that the constant news coverage on COVID is creating a false perception or expectation among news consumers? 
that we can and should be accounting for any and every change along the way. So here you are, we all are, you know, living with this constant barrage of changing information and so many uncertainties. And of course, it is your job as journalists to, to respond to that deluge of information. But is it maybe creating some expectations among news consumers that aren't, aren't fair? Anyone? And, and Amy, if you have insights on this too, please. I can speak to that a little bit um, from the local perspective. I've <laughs> I've had kind of editorial ethical questions with our editors on stuff like this, you know, because information changes hourly. Um, so at what point do you need to update a big story and go in and, you know, of course, explain to the editor or to, to the readers that you have, you know, updated the data or, you know, cer a certain aspect of just the COVID situation in Mississippi. Um, I've tried to break up my day to where I kind of tweet about the latest numbers and then use those to inform coverage moving forward rather than looking back because we can never just, you know, make all of the coverage up to date. Um, there has sort of been a little bit of a false sense of my ability to keep that information live constantly. Like yesterday, the health department was about five hours behind where they usually are. Turns out it's because they were releasing a lot more data. So I was thankful for that five hours because I got data I can actually analyze myself, you know, download it into files. Um, they really changed the they were reporting, so it was helpful. But I had a bunch of um, not angry, but excited uh, readers on Twitter kind of demanding the most recent numbers that just didn't exist because they hadn't been updated. But I had set the precedent of, of updating readers every day at 10 a.m. So I think if readers like and trust what we've done so far, kind of give us a benefit of the doubt for, you know, half a day, make trust that we're, we're, we're on it, we're going to get it to you. Um, but I think overall, readers being more engaged and not more demanding, but more engaged with how we're reporting is a good thing. I've had more feedback than I ever have as a reporter. 90% of it has been thanking me for helping local folks on the ground understand how this impacts them. So I think if anything, this can show an expanded group of readers that we've been trying to do this kind of coverage all, all along. Um, it's just come into, like we said, unprecedented focus. So if you like what we've done, trust us that we'll keep doing this, um, just hopefully not uh, every day <laughs> for the rest of the year. <laughs> I, mean, I wanna add that one silver lining, I think, to the coverage um, of the coronavirus, I hope, is, um, well, I don't know, I'm, like some of the data from Amy makes me a little nervous, but um, that readers start to understand that science doesn't happen overnight and that, uh, you know, we are all learning about this coronavirus. The readers are learning about it at the same time that we are and that they get to see that if we don't always have the answers and the information right away, it's because it's just not available and we're getting it to them as fast as we can. Um, but uh, hopefully it also creates a new respect for the process of coming to certainty on some of these questions. Excellent. Any, any other thoughts on, on that particular comment or question? Um, here's an interesting question. Do you think more um, news outlets would see greater reader satisfaction if the process of reporting, how we reported the story, sharing the facts that dozens of people and resources were consulted, et cetera, um, were shared along with the story. So we actually do do that. Um, I think there's a note with the story that, uh, that says, I don't know if it was from this story, but there, that information is collected. And for example, for the story that I mentioned where we did rely on multiple departments, first of all, at the bottom of the story, it says everybody who contributed to reporting but also I know that the PR department was asking us at one point, you know, how many people did we talk to and putting together um, an explanation of that. And the Times also does this thing called the Times Insider, where reporters will talk about how they reported certain stories or, you know, what the process was. And so um, they do Q and A's with readers. Um, you know, we try to do that as much as possible. But one thing that really resonated for me with what Jill was saying is just this, this fire hose. I mean, we, you know, there's only so much time in the day and, and I have never worked this hard in my life. I feel like I am constantly on 
and responding to you know stories that need to be written, questions on Twitter, uh, queries from editors. It is like this this wheel that you can't get off of. And you know we are looking at. Um, I mean, I've been looking at papers with five people, you know, in the paper, which I would never have looked at twice before. But now I am. And you know, as the person who asked me the question earlier, like how much am I doing my own analysis? Some of the time, you know, you're having to make judgments about is this even worth covering. Um, and the standards for that have completely changed. So we can all be more transparent. We can all be more transparent about how we make the decisions on what to cover. Um, but I would say it's not that we don't want to, it's that we don't always have the time to. I'd say that's something that we've really been trying to do on anything that's investigative in nature or um, accountability or data heavy. Um, I think that it'd be, it'd be so difficult to do um, on a, it'd be so difficult to do on, on every single story. Um, but yeah, I think it's picking and choosing where that feels appropriate and where, and, and important and where, where it might be more, um, more effort than it's worth. I mean, one thing I want to add to that, I guess, is um, when, when I write the science stories, I always try to include links. And I know I've gotten emails from readers saying they're very appreciative of that to the the papers that I'm writing about or they, where my information comes from so that if people do want to follow the trail and draw their own conclusions, they can. One thing also that I think is important is saying what we don't know. So, and that's something where you don't have to have it in the block, but I think in a lot of our stories, kind of a, a to, for us to exaggerate what we do know about the coronavirus, as Apoorva was saying, like we are, we're all learning too, and there's so much we don't know. And so I will, I will say providing that context in, in throughout the coverage is incredibly important. Um, okay, so another question here that I think um, all of you could probably respond to to some degree or another, but I'd like to start with Amy. The question is, for many years, the number of local news organizations have been in decline. Do you anticipate any changes for local news after this crisis? Um, might it be more valued um, or not? And I wonder, Amy, if you all have any, any research on this or if you've looked at this question at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a terrific question. Um, and I, you know, we did a very large study of sort of local news in the US um, about a year ago. Um, which was fascinating. Local news has always been really important to the American public in most cases, you know, over, as we've asked this over years and years, people would say, you know, the portion of Americans saying they're following local news usually exceeds the portion you say they're following national news very closely. Um, it's a little, th those two numbers are a little, have been a little closer, um, sort of the last five years or so. Um, but, um, one of the things we saw was the degree to which people really, really value that sense of connection they feel um, from their local news media and that that sense of connection becomes um, really a really strong factor when you look at evaluations of the news media and sort of other questions that you follow up. That those who feel that sense of connection, which we asked about in many different ways, um, give much higher um, sort of different types of evaluations of their local news media. Um, what we also found a lot, a, a, a pretty striking lack of awareness when it comes to certain elements of the local media. And I think that sort of speaks to the last question that you all were, were responding to as well. Um, you know, we had a, over 70% um, of, of US adults say that they thought local news media was doing just fine financially. Um, and, you know, only 14% that had paid anything in the last year, even if it was a donation or membership. So definitely that's just an example of sort of the lack of awareness of the industry of what's happening in the industry. We've seen as you all are all very aware, I'm sure, day after day after day since this outbreak, more layoffs, more places needing to close, cutbacks, even as production may be increasing 40%. I mean, that's what's sort of incredible. Um, so I, you know, I do think, and I'm not one that can speak for the industry as well, but certainly the American public sense of um, 
what it takes or the state of the industry may not be where journalists think it is. Um, and that's something we'll continue to ask about around sort of the, the coronavirus outbreak and their sense of sort of impact it may or may not be having on the news media itself. Um, so, you know, I'll be looking to share that data as we as we collect that and go further um, into the into the field. Any other uh, thoughts on that question? I mean, I would just add that I, I, I fear for local journalism right now because of the, I mean, we, we have, you know, have had to, um, almost every public radio station um, in the system had to cancel their spring pledge drive. Um, and the ones who went forward with them, they did, the reports out were that they were, did not do well. Um, that's changed. That's changing a bit now. We're actually KOW today is doing our. We're trying to raise one million dollars in one day to make up for the lack of having a week long pledge drive. And also, um, you know, we the businesses that underwrite on KOW or a lot of the businesses that are closed right now. Um, you know, there are so many. I mean, the unemployment rate is astronomical. Um, so donations generally would be down. Um, you know. It, major giving, which we rely on in public media, that is down um, as people are, you know, I mean, it's just, um, it's a time where if people can, it's like, it's so important that they do support their local journalism, whether it's their station or paper, 